Hello, Steve Alex again, podcast two of uh, the story about Alexander Dumas, the general. Now, on the last podcast, I mentioned that he was the uh, son of a French marquis, a nobleman, and a Haitian uh, woman, uh, and uh, that uh, he was a mulatto, and that he had um, gone, in, gone into the army, enlisted in the army when he was 19, and uh, by the time he was 35, he was a general and outranked Napoleon, who was at that time was still a major. And that he won quite a bit of uh, battles. In fact, he won all the battles for, uh, that he ever fought. Uh, Dumas never lost a single battle in all the time he fought. And um, he ended up being under uh, Napoleon when, when Napoleon went to Italy. He helped uh, Napoleon conquer Italy, and he was made governor there. Now, after Napoleon uh, conquered uh, Italy, he went to Egypt, and he took, uh, you know, General Dumas with him. And uh, General Dumas distinguished himself at the Battle of the Grand Mosque, at which time he was, um, you know, Napoleon was, was, was very pleased with him. Uh, you said that uh, Napoleon and Dumas had fallen out. Uh, when did that happen? Well, that happened when uh, Dumas said that he wanted to go back to Italy. Okay. And Napoleon didn't want him to leave because he was, uh, he was Napoleon's backbone. This is backbone. And uh, what happened was that um, Napoleon's navy got destroyed at uh, the port of Abawa. Okay? What and country is that? That was in Egypt, when he was Egypt. still in Egypt. Okay. Okay. Now his troops were cut off from being able to come back home. So what happened was that uh, they, they, his generals were getting disgruntled. They held a meeting in Dumas' tent to, uh, you know, plan a mutiny on Napoleon. Right. Wow. Now uh, Napoleon, knowing that, that it was in Dumas' tent, blamed him for they thought that he had organized the whole thing. And they, they had a big a big falling out. Okay. And um, they were, you know, it was a tremendous rip between them. And then what happened? The Egyptians led a revolt against Napoleon. Okay. Now, um, how do you think uh, Napoleon solved the problem? How did Napoleon put down the revolt in Egypt? He called in Duma. Duma did it for him, as usual. And Duma put down the revolt. Now, Napoleon was so happy that he had done it. He promised Duma that he was going to have a portrait painted of him, of that uh, the battle that that uh, you know, suppressed the uh, Egyptian revolt. And uh, what happened was uh, Duma ne it, well, it never came about, and uh, I'll explain why later. But anyway, the uh, Napoleon ended up having a portrait of a white general who wasn't even there, who didn't even exist leading the, uh, ch the uh, charge against the, uh, the Egyptian uh, up upsurge. Now the reason that um, it, 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 the portrait never got painted was because uh, uh, Duma really decided that he was going to go back to Italy and he did leave Napoleon so he wasn't even there to have the portrait painted. And Napoleon was fuming because he had, he had lost his right arm, but maybe both his arms. to Italy, but unknown to him, the Italians had, you know, revolted and taken over the uh, the country again. Now, as soon as Duma got off the boat, he was arrested by the Italians and put in prison. And he was in prison for a little over two years, at which time they kept feeding him food with poisons in him, so that uh, he was gradually getting weaker. He was finally released. And he tried to get back into the army, the French army. But Napoleon was so angry with him for abandoning him that he refused to let him get into the army, he refused to let him be enlisted. And now here's the thing he had forced tribute from the Italians. I don't know how he did it, since the Italians were now a uh, sovereign nation again. But um, he forced them to pay for the, uh, you know, the time that uh, they imprisoned Duma. But he never turned any of that money over to Duma. He 
kept it for himself. So Duma ne never got uh, you know, any money, and he died, consequently, very poor at the age of 43. Okay, that, that wraps it up for uh, you know, General Alexander Duma. Now, the last time I was here in my last podcast, I never introduced my friend, Cal. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, or maybe he can tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, he used to work in a bank. Cal, uh, what did you do in the bank? Oh, I used to work in the bank, and uh, unfortunately I started robbing banks. Um, back in 1970, uh, I robbed 12 banks. Uh, I was coming out the bank. Excuse me, I had sixteen thousand dollars in a brown paper bag. In one hand, I had a gun, a thirty-two. In the other hand, as I'm coming out the bank, somebody said halt. And when I turn around, come to find out it was a captain for the Maryland State Troopers. And uh, so I started running, and he started shooting. And we were in a parking lot, like a shopping mall. And uh, I'm running between cars, he's running between cars. And back then, they didn't have no, uh, they had uh, 357 Magnums, the state troopers did. And when he shot, it scared me so bad, I pissed on myself. That's how bad it scared me. And, uh, unfortunately, uh, I shot him three times. I got up, I ran away. I didn't drop the bag. But I couldn't get to my car. Because the police were coming. And, uh, so I seen a guy, a young guy and his girl sitting in, in the car. I tapped on the window, had a cigarette in my hand, asked him, did he have a light? And when he rolled the cigarette, when he rolled the window down, I put the gun in, in, in the window, told him to open up the door. He opened up the door. I told him to get me away from that. That's how I got the two kidnapping charges. I didn't hurt him. That was not my intention. My intention was to get away from there. I got away. Six months later, they got me. Uh, a friend of mine, they had a $20,000 reward out for me. A friend of mine gave me up. Unfortunately, he wound up dying from a drug overdose. I got 20 years for the bank robberies and for shooting the police. I came home in 1985. I did almost 16 years. I came home, I stayed in the streets almost about three and a half years. I was doing some hustling in Baltimore, me and a couple friends of mine who was in the fence with me. And uh, some things had happened and it was time for me to leave Baltimore. How'd you get to Baltimore? Well, that's where I was from. I'm oh, from Baltimore. Baltimore. Oh, I didn't I'm that. from Baltimore. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine who was in the, the feds with me had a security business here in New York. So uh, he offered me a job. And this guy, he, he, what, what was his background? Huh? What was just this guy's background? He was a uh, 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 a credit card scammer. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. He and, had a security business. And he had a security business. Well, he got the security business when he came home. Yeah. yeah. So he offered me a job. I came to New York. But anyway, I stayed in the streets almost three and a half years. They were still mad at me behind shooting the police. 
and they wanted to get me. Did he die in the police? No, he didn't die in there. Um, but he was in pretty bad shape. Um, they wound up locking me back up for a technical violation. No new criminal activity, but a technical violation. They knew I was involved in some things, but they didn't have enough evidence to convict me, to charge me. But by me being on federal parole, that's how they got me. So they took me back in for a technical violation. They took the three and a half years that I did on the streets, they took that from me, put that on the back. I went back in for another eight. So I wound up doing 24 on 20. Yeah. The feds are rotten bastards where they want to be, man. Trust me. You so, want them to do a score for me? Yeah, so anyway, I came up here to New York. This was in 1999. And, uh, working for security for my friend, he wound up losing the business. So when he uh, lost the business, instead of me going back to Baltimore, I stayed in New York. I went to the shelter system. I stayed in the shelter system three years, almost, almost three years. God is good, I got my section eight. When I got my Section 8, I moved to the Bronx. I was living in uh, Manhattan, in Harlem. So I got my Section 8, I moved to the Bronx, on Arthur Avenue, and I've been here ever since. Uh, so don't tell us about the incident uh, when you uh, well, do the guy too. Me and the uh, police up here, I had, maybe, I don't know, I don't, maybe I was paranoid or whatever, but I thought that, that they were trying to get me too. So, I was over on 187, I mean, uh, 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 when a guy approached me about some drugs, and I said, man, get the hell away from me. I don't know nothing about the drugs. So we exchanged a few words, and he got in my face. And I thought he was going to try to hurt me physically. So we got into a tussle, and I wound up throwing him through the Dunkin' Donuts window. The police jumped out the van wrestled with me, threw me to the ground, locked me up. Uh, nothing ever came of it. I mean, I stayed, I stayed locked up for like two months. They let me go. Then they tried to make me pay restitution for the window. Three hundred some dollars for the window. Man. Dump, dump, I remember man. that. Uh, that was a, uh, it was a black DA, right? It was the black, black DA. DA. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So right. it seems to me. Like, uh, now that the, the blacks are starting to get some power, that they're starting to turn uh, conservative. Exactly. Yeah, so. Exactly. Exactly. Like, like they were turning on their own. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they always say you never give a, you never give a black man too much power. And uh, I didn't know what they were saying back then, but now I see now. I see what they were talking about now. Um. But uh. I turned my life around. I'm 68 now. I have a grandson who I love very much. Um, all my family's deceased except for my sister. My son, my sister, and my grandson. That's all I have left. And they're very close to me. About four months ago, I was having problems with my health. And I went to the hospital and they found out that I had stage three colon cancer. 
um, I'm dealing with that today. But uh, I thank God that I'm still here. And I'm grateful for that. And I count my blessings every day. If I go today or tomorrow, I'm not mad because I live my life. I made some bad decisions. I made some good decisions. But now I'm just living out my life and I'm grateful for that. Well, we were talking last time about um, how the, the uh, blacks have been treated, the black soldiers have been, been treated no matter how they conducted themselves in battle. Exactly. exactly. And um, I was at a, uh, a party uh, yesterday, somebody brought up uh, an interesting point, made an interesting statement. Uh, the guy asked me, what's the opposite of, uh, of love? And uh, I said, that, no, he said, um, well, what's, what's the opposite of, of evil? And, um, and uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I, I, that was another conversation. He did say, um, what, 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 what's the opposite uh, of love? And uh, of course I said, hate. And he said, no, the opposite of love is fear. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. That's a good point. point. That's a good point. Good, yeah, and I thought about it because, you know, what, what, what you fear, you know, makes you see, it, it brings out the hate and, and, and rage in you. Like, for instance, take a cornered rat. You see a rat running around in, in the like in parking lot. You run after it, it'll, it'll take off. It'll, it won't find anywhere near you. You but, get that rat. But if you corner him. You get him in the corner, like a broom handle. You. He'll run right up that broom handle and jump right at, at you. He's coming right, right. at you. Right. It's a, and he'll be in, in, a, in a rage. Right. And um, this is what, what I was really talking about the uh, last time with the, uh, the black soldiers when they came back from the war all the uh, the, the, the white people uh, were starting to think uh, now, they're, now they're gonna you know we'll, we'll want to be treated equal and the white people we can't have that they were they were scared that they would uh, eventually get uh, too much control like um, they did in, in, in Wilmington uh, North Carolina right, right I don't know if I went into that um, last time did I talk about yeah you talked about the last yeah. time yeah and um that's it. In fact, I used to work out at the um, Fort Apache gym, and it was, it was a you know uh, the black and Hispanics were working out there. But the uh, guy who ran the gym, but was a black man, he was telling me stories about how guys came back from World War II, they didn't have any um, any clothes, so they were wearing their uniform. And when the uh, is that right? Soldier, they didn't have any clothes. No, they didn't have any any, any wardrobe. They weren't naked. But they didn't, but they, they didn't have anything to put on, they didn't have any money. And they were wearing their uniform, one guy was. And um, one of the uh, locals said, boy, what are you doing in that uniform? You're not in the army anymore. He says, I know, but i got nothing else to wear. And they lynched him for wearing the uniform, they, they, they hanged him. Where was this at? This was uh, some uh, state in, in, in the South. But, you know, I don't want to, want to dump on the South here and say, well, what do you expect from the South? Because uh, a lot of this stuff uh, happened uh, in, in, in the north as well. In fact, <coughs> you know that John Brown. Remember John Brown? You were John Brown, right? Back right. in the early 1800s, right? He became an abolitionist because right. of an incident that uh, happened to him. See, he was a shepherd, right? And he was driving his herds up to uh, you know, uh, you know, around, and he stopped off at this uh, one uh, farmhouse, and the. Um, the owner was very nice. He gave him, you know, um, food and all that. He gave water for his yeah, but, slide. But, you know, this is the time uh, when they, you know, they had the slave in the north. I remember well, that, yes. And this was, you know, and uh, all over. And so one of the, the slaves came, you know, uh, was a slave boy came to about his John Brown's age. And John Brown was like 12 at the time. And this black kid starts talking to him. And when the owner of the house saw that this black kid had dead to, to they think that he had, had the right to talk to a black man. Right. He took a poker out of the fire place and he almost beat the kid to death. Is that right? Right in front of, in front of 
John Brown, John Brown got sick to his stomach from it. And from that moment on, he, uh, he became an abolitionist. Right. That's what made him an abolitionist. Right. So, you know, you can, you can say that, um, you know, well, what do you expect from the South? But this incident happened in Connecticut. In the law. Yeah. Well, maybe it was Southern Connecticut. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the, there was a lot, a lot of cruelty uh, done all, all around. Right. In fact, um, I remember seeing, I, I belonged to uh, the Southern Poverty, contributed to Southern Poverty and the uh, association. And uh, they sent me uh, things every so often. One, um, I think they sent me, uh, we used to have a magazine, and they had something written by uh, Andrew Young. He was the... Uh, Andrew Young? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he was showing... Ambassador Andrew Young. Yeah. He was showing a picture of how they uh, had, uh, they, they didn't lynch this one black man, but they had him tied to us. Yeah. Grid on, you know, right, wouldn't, right. and they're setting fire to him. You see the faces on these um, people who are watching it burn, and uh, their eyes are like laser. And the, the, you can see the, the insanity in him. And this is this was a horrible thing about the, the, the black history in this country that they were the, the victims of, of people who were me mentally un unstable, and they were at their mercy. That, that, that's the, the horrible thing. In fact, if, uh, did, did you ever read that book, The Twelve Years of Slavery? No, I never read that. It was about a, uh, a free black man from New York, okay? He was not a slave, but um, he had, um, you know, he, he was wasn't doing, he played, he was a violinist, and he, he wasn't doing too well financially. Someone offered him a job, you know, playing a violin in a circus. They said, why don't we uh, have some dinner over? So they had dinner, and the, the guy drugged his drink. And uh, what happened was he used to have these um, black, uh, and they were black, uh, white gangs roaming around in the north, looking for uh, you know blacks who were like uh, by themselves, like just coming off for work, right, right, right. all that. And they captured them. They tear up their, their papers, and they'd sell them to people who sold slaves. To um, to the uh, oh, sir, southerners, yeah, right. or even the, the, the northerners, right? And that's what happened to him. He ended up, uh, you know, being in, on a plantation in Louisiana for about 12 years before he was able to find someone who could get back up the north to north uh, to tell his friends to get him some paper, the paperwork, right, right, right. And, and free him. Right. And. Um, what happened, but in the meantime, he, he, was, he was whipped, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the owner of the plantation was, was, was kind of sick. He used to go around stabbing the, 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 the slaves in the back. You know, just, I don't know why he did it, he was just mentally deranged. And he had a wife who liked, who liked this slave, this black guy. But, see, uh, she had, um, this black, uh, I mean, white plantation owner owned his slaves, and he had this little girl that uh, she used to raise the girl from baby. But the girl grew up to be a beauty, and the uh, her husband liked her because she was a good worker. And she was jealous of the fact that uh, he liked her this girl and came to hate her. And she do all all kinds of stuff to her. She like to take broken glass and throw it at her. And then she, she was met to the rage. And one time, the, uh, she, you know, she was supposed to wash, they didn't give her any soap. So she went to another plantation to get some soap, a little piece of soap to wash. And uh, the wife, was, you know, told her husband about that, that, that she tried to run away. And so he, he staked it down, and they, they wanted this, uh, the man who wrote this book was a slave. Right. Yeah, we saw, saw from, you know, the uh, plantation's arms would get tired, so they had the slaves do the whipping. Right, right. So they had this guy doing, he had this uh, guy, the, you know, the violinist, doing the whipping for him. So he used to fake the whipping, and it was good. Right, right, right. This time, it was they're right up front, and he watched him. And he said, no, I refuse to do it. So the uh, plantation owner said, God damn, he took the whip from him, and he beat this woman to the bones would come out of her back. Wow. And this is a, a horrible thing that um, 
the, um, the, the blacks, the slaves, were the victims of people who were mentally, mentally ill. And it, 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 there's nothing worse than that. I, I, I ran across people like that when I was in the Marines, some sergeants who, uh, you know, when I was going through boot camp. And when you get out of boot camp, it's not that bad, but in, in, uh, when you're going through boot camp, but back in the old days, not, not, not now, but back in when I was in, they were allowed to do anything to you in those, in those squad bays, and they did. And if they, they had a, you know, uh, with a bad mood, you know, uh, One time when I was in, in that place, in one of those the penal institutions, and uh, I was going to come out, and uh, it figured that I, I, I was ready to come out. It, but the guy who, uh, one of the sergeants said, about it, I think it, he needs to be sent back a little bit. You know? And he refused to let me out, and I could see that his face was turning red, his eyes were blazing. And I realized that this guy, he enjoyed doing this kind of stuff. He's a real red man. Yeah, and uh, this time he was a red face too. He right, was, right, right. and uh, to be under, you know, subjected to people like this, I know what, what, what it's like. In fact, one, one of the incidents that uh, in the book was, was when the um, after that the, that gang had captured him, right. he was in a big uh, group of people who were being auctioned off, right. and one was a uh, was a woman. She, she had two little children. And um, the plantation owner says, uh, you know, let, let me uh, t take the children uh, with her. I don't want to break up the family. Right. But the, the guy who was selling it was one of these sickles. And he knew how much it would hurt this woman to lose her children. He refused to sell the children to, uh, to, to the plantation owner just, just so he could take them away from the, from the, the, the woman. Right, right. And, so you, you can understand a lot of the, the hatred. If the, if the um, you know, the, the blacks might have, then a lot of it was, what was earned by right, right, what, what, right. Uh, what we had done to them. Right, right, I wouldn't right. say we, because right, I, right. I was I never a slave yeah, owner. Yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, and um, I, I, I just wanted to, to bring that out. And uh, when these uh, black soldiers came back from World War II, they say I, I, it was probably on the on the back of the the, the white uh, people's mind that uh, what they had done and uh, figured you know these guys ever get the upper hand they might do this uh, do the same thing today right right it um, the situation reminds me of something that Thomas Jefferson said when he was describing slavery and he said uh, slavery is like a wolf that you have by the tail. You don't want to keep holding on to them, but you're afraid to let them go. And, right? right. And that, that they were afraid if they ever freed the slaves, and the the slaves would uh, would get back at them. Uh, right. Like for instance, white people when uh, they were. Well, the, he had a white. He had a white girl. I mean, he had a black girl as 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 as, as one of the, A couple. Well, quite a, quite a few. Quite a few. Thomas Jefferson. Did. They said a lot of his uh, you know slaves had red hair. He, right. He had red hair. Right. Right. But, oh yeah. They did, they, did, they did that, um, but then they also had this uh, place, and this I, I got from a book, uh, it was uh, a documentary, it was written by it was essays of people who were like, in, in history, and, they, and this one thing was about these two British people who, who were visiting from, uh, um, you know, from England, and they went to this one place whereby you, you were allowed to bring your slaves, and uh, what they do is, They'd stake them to the ground and uh, they'd have have them whipped for, for no reason, any reason, or no, or no reason. And uh, this one guy, he had, uh, you know, bought this black mistress that he had been fooling around with because I guess he, um, in the back of his mind, he felt that it wasn't right to do it with, with his um, with animal for another color. Instead of whipping himself, he. Uh, Mentally ill people, a lot of them do. Right. They, they project the, the, the guilt onto other people. Right. And he had the uh, and he had a whip. And um, I know it was a black man who was doing the whipping too that they used. Right. So, uh, but when the, these two people uh, watched this, they, they said 
they, they thought that the, they felt like they were in Sodom and Gomorrah. Is that right? Because of the, you know, the, the evil that was all around them. And, uh, well, as, as Jefferson himself said, once said, he said, if there's such a thing as a just God, we're going to eventually one day have to pay for all this. <laughs> he said that. He, he said that. that. He said that. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. But, um, and that's what the, uh, and a lot of these, you know, white folk uh, were afraid of that their judgment day would come and they would, be, they would have to pay for it. Like when my people in the uh, concentration camps, after they were liberated, after they were liberated, the soldiers gave the, um, the prisoners guns and said, oh, "Go kill these bastards who did that to you." And they had a field day on, the, on these guards and all that because of all that hate that was built up. And, right. You got to understand one thing. My people were, um, went through this for four years. The, the blacks went through this for almost two centuries right. before they, they were free. Now, try to imagine. I can't even imagine. You're born into this situation. My people had in the back of their mind to walk out last forever when it is, we'll be free. But here are these, these blacks. They were born into it. Their fathers, their grandfathers, their great-grandfathers have been, you know, slaves. And for them, there was nothing but this. For them, they, they had no hope. Right. And, right. Uh, and, and how that, this, can, this can break you, as, as Mark Twain once said, he was sponsoring a, uh, an, an ex-slave who, who wanted to uh, be a lawyer. And Mark Twain gave him the uh, money to, to uh, go to law school. And he's, Mark Twain said, had the guy been white, I do not think I would have done it. He says, uh, but well, we ground the manhood out of these people, and uh, you know we owed them. Right. And yeah. that man ended up being a lawyer who Thurgood Marshall clerked for. Him. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Supreme Court Justice. Well, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. But um, so uh, I, I try to, to to imagine, you know, what it would be like if, if I had been born into. The, 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 the situation where you know not only don't don't you have any hope you don't foresee any hope and you don't foresee any future right. and uh, and it's it really uh, it, it creates on me as uh, you know what, what we subjected human beings to right, 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 right. and uh, that um, do you have anything to, to add to that, Cal? Well, that's, that, 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 that's, that's, that's a very true situation. And uh, believe it or not, it's still happening today. Today is still happening. Well, believe it or not, Cal, that they, they still have slavery in Africa. They still have it. They still have that's, that's what I'm trying to say. They still have it today. And, and uh, uh, the situ like the situation with uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Both the... Uh, 20, 27 years back from because he wanted to vote. Yeah, yeah. Because he, because, because he wanted his people to vote. And he put him in jail for 27 years. Hard labor. Yeah, I know. And what happened, he wound up being the president of right. South Africa. That, that was an apartheid. I'm talking about even in, in the free black countries. Right. You have, you have blacks holding, holding slaves. Hold, yeah, holding, holding black. And in uh, fact, uh, I, I saw a documentary on Channel 13. With this uh, guy who had been a slave himself, and he, he, he got free. And what he does is he tries to rescue these kids from uh, others, you know, you, you slave, you know, not not slave, but uh, other blacks who uh, have bought them. See, when a family in these countries, these poor African countries, need money, they'll they'll sell um, their, their children the children to children. slavery. Yeah, so, so I mean, we, we did it in this country too. In fact, Davy Crockett, yeah. back in the early 1800s. His father couldn't uh, couldn't feed the family, so they sold. They, 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 his, his father sold Davy Crockett as an indentured servant. Is that right? Yeah, that's I right. didn't know that. That's right. There was a, a story, and um, the story goes in the uh, it's in the Encyclopedia Britannica and uh, other uh, writings that he had had a, a, a uh, there was a, a school child who was bullying right. him, an older kid who was bullying him, and. Uh, what he did was that um, he hid in the brush when the kid was coming home from school. He jumped out, but then he was an alley cat, started making noises. 
distraction when the kid ran away. And that he was so afraid that the retribution for this kid, that he ran away from home. Baby Crack was not afraid of retribution. He did not run away from home. His father uh, sold him into a dentist servant. Wow. Servant to, how do oh, I know this? Because I, I read his autobiography. Oh, okay. okay. And that, that, that's, that was his explanation. Okay. I figured he should know better than anyone who's writing about it. Right, right, right. But that was, uh, so we, we, did, we did the same thing. Right. In fact, in, the, uh, in, in Asia, it's, uh, it's, uh, they, they sell these, their daughters into prostitution. Right, 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 right. And um, they really get going to horrendous conditions. I like, saw so this one documentary about this uh, girl who was sold in there. And one of the uh, people who was screwing and banging her, actually gouged out one of her eyes and she wanted to go for treatment. And they said, no, we can't afford to, to lose the business. They made her continue having, having sex with these people with, her, with her, her eye inflamed and all that. So eventually the skin actually grew over, over her eye. Uh, they, they wouldn't let her out. It's, I, I, I see it uh, when uh, you know, these girls, they come around, they, um, the women selling the, um, the, the, the you know, uh, pirated c CDs and all that. Right, right, right. One woman used to come here, she had her uh, side of her leg was black and blue because she comes home to her husband, she doesn't make enough money, he goes into the floor and starts kicking her. Beats him. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, but um, getting back to the, the, what I saw about this uh, guy in Africa, what he'd do, sometimes he'd just, you know, take the kids and there's something they'd run away from, he'd capture them, he'd take them back and he, he, he had, had this orphanage set up with the school and so he gives them an education and um, then he tries to find the family for them. Now uh, what I'm thinking is what happens if that family wants to do a hard financial hardship and sells them back sells again. Them back. Yeah, yeah. But uh, sometimes that, um, he, he can't you know, uh, actually capture him. He'll try to, uh, to bargain with the owners and the owners are angry. Right. They'll say, you know, I'm I'm not giving you my slave. I wouldn't give you my car. I'm not giving you my right, slave. Right, I paid for both of them. You're right, not taking them from right, me. Right, and they have right, to negotiate. Right, right, right. And um, these kids are they're treated the same way they were treated in the plantation. Right, right. Yeah, you know, they, they get whipped or they let their children whip them. Right. And it's uh, you know it's it's I'm, I'm looking for for the progress. You know it's uh, it's, it's you know it's, it's, it's like these these cartoons when someone sees a, a bump on the road with dirt, he pounds it down and it pops up somewhere else. Pops up somewhere else. And right. it's just like, right. like what, 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 what's happening with the, um, yeah, the situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, I got you. But uh, anyway, so um, now a lot of you might, might uh, be, be uh, wondering you know, why I'm doing this and what makes me such an authority on, on black people. I'm going to tell you what makes me an authority. First of all, I'm going to tell you I'm not an authority. I get my authority from all these books. So this book, I want you to get a good shot of it. It was written by J.A. Rogers. He's a, he's a black anthropologist and historian. I you to get a good, good look at this. Can you get a good shot of that? Okay. Now I also want to show you... Um, let me see. Let me get... Um, I never... Uh, you know, you, you never got a picture. I never got... To, show you a picture of Alexander Dumas. So um, I wanted to uh, see if I can find this book. I mean, in, in this book. Um, here we go, here we go, here we go. What, uh, get a good shot of what Alexander, General Alexander Dumas looked like. I never got to, you got a good shot of that? Okay. So as you can see, I'm gonna look this over, Cal. And also I, I get my material from this book by uh, Margot Lee uh, Shetterly, okay? Um, he wrote the uh, hidden, sorry. Hidden figures, okay? So, 
I get all my information from black historians. It's not white propaganda. It's not um, just my think of what uh, I think the black people are. This is all, I have documented evidence of all the accomplishments that uh, were achieved by, by black people. And um, I also wanted to uh, say, now that we've had a serious talk, don't forget my uh, the, the, the other side of me, the light side of me. When I do my, um, you know, singing and uh, my, my jokes, so check out my website, uh, www.thecoffeebreakclub.com. Or check me out, uh, just look up the uh, Coffee Break Club on uh, YouTube. I'll look for the icon with me and the pretty woman uh, having a, a cup of coffee together. And uh, have a good time.